Hello. Uh, thank you for joining us today as we explore finding Polish records in historical regions. I'll start with a bit of housekeeping. Just a reminder that there is a live chat box where you can send through any questions or comments that you have. We will do our best to answer all your questions, but if we do run out of time, please get in touch with us via email or our socials. First off, I would like to introduce our wonderful presenter, Rafael. He's Polaron's senior researcher backed with a master's degree in history. Rafael is an excellent field researcher and has worked within this industry for many years. I have yet to meet someone with so much passion for the work they do. Welcome, Rafael. I also would like to give a warm welcome to Eva Hussein. Eva is the proud founder and director of Polaron, and she's a recognized leader in the field of translations and European citizenship. A little bit of a fun fact about Eva is she, just like Rafael, used to play basketball growing up. Apparently basketball runs deep in Polaron's roots. Uh, now Eva, tell me a bit about the work conducted at Polaron European Services. Uh, thank you so much, um, Angelo, and welcome everyone. Um, so we meet again, which is fantastic. Uh, and um, today we're going to be talking about um, looking for records. Um, and um, this is what we do. Um, you've already mentioned the word passion. And I think it is very true that we uh, are very passionate about what we do. But the work um, that we do in the space of um, finding records is quite specialized. So mostly we look for documents that help people reclaim their European citizenship. And for those of you that don't know, we don't just work with Polish, we also do German, Slovak, Czech and a few others. Um, but um, generally speaking, um, the research bit supports um, applications for uh, European citizenship or, you know, uh, specifically Polish, um, German, Slovak, Czech and others. Um, we also help people with administrative um, management of their cases. All right, I think we can move on to the next slide. Okay, so today we're going to be um, covering um, former Polish territories. So um, I'm sure that most people that have joined this webinar and we have more than 200 people sign up. So obviously there's a lot of interest, know this, but um, Poland was wiped off the map uh, for 123 years due to partitions. And even after uh, Poland regained independence in um, 1918, um each uh the borders shifted back and forth quite a bit so a large chunk of polish territories um in 1945 went to ussr today's ukraine um so the borderlands that you're seeing now on on the map are the areas that poland um, lost but we also gained some um on the west um so former german territories so Geopolitically, Poland's always been, um, you know, in a sort of tough uh, spot between Germany and Russia and Austri also uh, Austria-Hungarian Empire, which of course doesn't exist today. But what it means to our work is that many people um, that come from this area um, were Polish, um, but finding records is a challenge uh, for many of um, people that work with us. And that is what we're going to be talking about today. All right, so this is the beach where I hand over to Rafael to tell us a bit more about his work and how we um, work to obtain records from our former Polish territories. Thank you, Eva. Can you hear me? Hello, everybody. So welcome again to our webinar. I'm so very happy to be with you, uh, here with you. And today, uh, as Eva said, we'll be talking about a little, um, a little about the um, problems of the research of the areas of uh, Eastern borderlands. Uh, that subject seems to be very interesting also for me because a part of my family came from Ukraine. So that also was of my interest for making this research in that region. And if you joined our previous webinars you know that uh, the last time there was a more theory today there will be more practice i want to show you some of the hints and tips 
how do we use, uh, for example, online sources to track our families or information about them or information about these areas. Surprisingly, we can find a lot of interesting materials uh, online and sometimes no need to send an official letters to Ukrainian, Belarus or to Lithuanian um, uh, archives to obtain some of the information, a lot of documents, a lot of uh, index names, a lot of very interesting uh, uh, historical sources are able from our, our home computers. So let's get started. Uh, probably we have got for the, about um, 20 minutes for that presentation. So I will try to keep the time limit. And then of course uh, we have uh, a time for questions. Okay, so uh, I have no doubt that I won't be able to show you everything, especially how to work with some of the historical documents who are the scanned form of lines. But of course I'm going to uh, to show you as much as possible. But starting uh, talking about, and today mostly I want to focus on the areas of Ukraine, yes, that we are too short time to show about uh, show everything, okay? But the ways of the search I show you today, they will be very similar if we are to uh, conduct this research also in Belarus or Lithuania or Latvia. Um, starting um, um, that presentation, I have to mention about also Paul Polish archives, because in the Polish archives we can find thousands of the metrical books from uh, the former region of Galicia, mostly from Western Ukraine right now, that records who have been transferred uh, due to the regular um, Polish-Soviet agreement from August 1940. 45. Uh, these records are able now in the central archive, uh, central archive of historical records in Warsaw, or in the public register office um, uh, of the city of. Warsaw. And uh, if we're talking about the first of this institution, the Central Historical Archive, we have the straight access to these records. I'm going to show you right now uh, how we can use this. Uh. Okay, I hope that uh, you see this, the first, uh, the website of the Central Historical Archive uh, of Warsaw, and you can find a number of the um, collections we can explore. Let's take a first one, for example, num number 300, that will be exactly the metrical books of the um, non-Christian denomination from the area so-called Zabuzhanskie, the periods between 1789 and 1943. If we open this link, it should take us straight to the general information about this collection and how we can use this. The first, we have to uh, understand um, uh, that uh, that collection has no name index, so which means that every books we have uh, an interest to make this research we have to um, we we need to make this research personally by scrolling page on uh, every next page the most important uh, uh, in that collection is to uh, uh, to make localization of uh, a proper village or town for example if we were interesting in the jews who lived in Lvov or one of the village, like for example, let's say Hushatin, uh, and this is exactly here. And Hushatin, uh, it shows us also a numbers of the um, uh, archival units. So, for example, if we are interested in Hushatin, uh, we're looking for the units 253 to 255, and then also will be county of Hushatin and also the numbers of these collections. And we're scrolling down, looking for the particular collection. So we're looking, for example, for 253. Uh -huh. We're almost there. And here it, here it is. And uh, from what I've learned, almost 100% of these collections have their scanned forms. So we just, uh, we have to click gallery with the scans and voila, we are here. But as I said, to find a proper name, we have to 
check every page because this website doesn't have exactly name index like for example family search which i'm going to show you next so i'm stopping um, sharing you this screen right now uh and let's go back to our presentation Uh, so the, sec the second uh, institution, Public Register Office of the City of Warsaw, has only a catalog of the records, which means uh, that they, we, uh, if we click this link, we can find that catalog with the names of the towns and the villages, but no information about the dates and, of course, no scan online because the sensitive data, because the records which still are stored in the public register office of the city of Warsaw are less than 100 years if we're talking about the birth certificates and 80 years if we're talking about the marriage and death certificates. And after that um, uh, uh, afterwards, of course, these records will be also transferred to the central archive of the, of the historical records. But currently, whenever we want to get anything from the public register office of the city of Warsaw, we have to send an official request. And of course, to present, uh, we need to present our legal interest because they won't be able to give us uh, uh, for a simple general research if we don't prove, you know, uh, no, um, a personal relation uh, from you to the people we are looking uh, in this archive. But if we are talking about the records from the Central Archive of Israel Records, of course, uh, the access is full for everyone. And we can, of course, order every interesting documents from this archive. Also, with the better quality, because the quality you've seen is maybe not the, the best quality. But of course, if we can locate a proper document, we can order uh, a definitely better copy the next one of course is the family search family search probably of course the website is well known of you and uh, honestly i still am surprised how many interesting information we can find on the family search of course if we have a full access um and only in exploring of the area of uh, ukraine uh i found metrical books and not only metrical books because if you see there are also the various types of the records, like confessionaries or revisionaries, very interesting records, almost unknown uh, among the Polish researchers. And this, um, uh, this website uh, is one of the best. And in fact, we have to start our research from family search if we are uh, looking for uh, information for almost every region in Ukraine. So just for example, let's look on the Kharkiv church records. Exactly here. So there's a general information about the collection. And of course, we can learn uh, how we can use this collection or just start working on it. And uh, of course, that will be the, there is a lot of options for uh, to use the browser uh, for making our research. If we, ha if we have um, uh, exactly data about the person we're looking for, we're putting on a proper um, um, uh, places. The first last name place of birth year, but if we want, we can extend this for more option. We can add spouse, uh, marriage, we can add some of children and, uh, to this research, and it should show us uh, everything. The, of course, now I don't know, for example, what type of person I'd be looking on the Kharkiv uh, metrical books. So let's say, for example, I'm looking someone whose name Stefan. Just we need to add some extra information to um, uh, start this research. And of course, this database 
uh, is showing us almost everything what it has. What more, uh, moreover, this is a um, uh, very good uh, family search. Uh, as I said, this is one of the best websites for making this research. It's not only because number of the records it has in the scanned form. Here, of course, it's written in Cyrilica. Stefan, for example, Yakovlev Pashkov. So let's take a look on this record. Uh, and what is really great with family search, that's especially for these people who can't read Russian manuscripts. Because yes, majority of the files we can find on family search who have been scanned from Ukrainian archives were written in Russian language, like this one, for example. But this is really good that they have also index or information of about the people you can find. So for example, on this page, exactly, it shows Stefan uh, Yakov Pashkov, um, uh, no need to read the manuscript. Uh, uh, this information can really help us to locate not only a proper person, but also read some of the extra information like uh, his sex, age, date of death, uh, place of death, and presumably uh, presentable year of his birth. Not all information, but general information. Yes, that Russian metrical books contain usually some of the extra information. So definitely it's better if we know a little bit language or we can know how to use the historical sources and how um, um, uh, what type of the data we can find. Uh, and as I said, that is not only a metrical books uh, we can find um, uh, on the um, uh, on the family search uh, confession lists, also uh, revision lists. Uh, sometimes uh, I've seen also uh, a very uh, special type of the source like status animaru. Uh, which is um, uh, a characteristic source for the church records. Uh, but uh, uh, technically, we can explore family search in every region. I just place here only a random choose. So metrical books like Donetsk, Cherkasy, Crimea, Kiev. Uh, in Kiev, for example, confession is, but also orthodox metrical records, um, uh, civil registers, uh, census records from 1897, so from the great census made in all Russian empire. Also that type of the records, uh, there's no link to this one, but you can find them also. Uh, that type of the records were very characteristic for all Russian empire and almost not, you will not find them in the Polish archives, except only one archive in Womża. I found that uh, census records of uh, 1897, but in uh, uh, in Ukraine or um, uh, Belarus, in many of regions, you can find the type of the sources as well. Uh, so the family search is a priority, but but where we can find us? Wikisource. Wikisource provides us also uh, a lot of Data. Of course, everyone has an access to the can can get an access to the wiki source, and of course, uh, better if we can uh, try to read Russian or Ukrainian. Okay, let's say for oh, this is exactly from the revision list from the um, uh, it's called in Russian uh, Revisky Yeskaski, and uh, this is exactly about the county of um, the county of. Uh, uh kiev so let me show you how good this source could be what is exactly the revisky skaski source this is uh, uh, that source uh came from the first taxing reform in russia started from the emperor peter the great uh, the first revisky skaski so the revision list started in 1719 and they continued several times the last one was ended after 18 58. So for example, here, we can put one of the data available here. So let's say 1834. And we have to check one of these. Let's say as, as a random choose. We can zoom it. 
to open the full file. Hmm. Maybe this was not exactly the, be the best example. This is a little different. Okay, let me try maybe another. Let's try 1811. Oh, here we are. So uh, what we can find in the revision list uh, records, usually uh, Russian Empire or uh, the Russian Empire Administry registered all the people who have been requested to pay a tax by person. So uh, and uh, and it was started just only from the peasants in 1718, but uh, afterwards uh, all classes, including nobility or uh, even um, priests, were also recorded in the revision lists, um, uh, and they noticed every person who lived in each house from many regions. All the, of course, they notice uh, the most important details, name, uh, the surname, age of the head of the house, their wives, but not for every revision, uh, not all the time in the revision list. Sometimes we can find only revision uh, lists where we uh, only men were noticed, but in 19th century, uh, probably all the families, men, women, and all of their children so uh, if we can find of course um uh, uh, a chance to um, uh, this is and this is very challenging research really because a lot of types of records uh, required uh, a lot of experience uh, in writing um, uh, russian uh, records but of course if we you can find revision lists on a family search, then this is a good chance, a really good chance that also they will uh, provide you a new index for this. So there will be no need to explore this uh, by uh, trying to um, um, identify every word in the on the revision list. Uh, on family search, you should have everything available. So, um, uh, revision list on the wiki source, but also other um, uh, records uh, we should, uh, we can find uh, on wiki source as well. Um, I think that uh, very important for every researcher or archivist is to know what type of the records we can find in the Ukrainian archives. So, uh, everything, in fact, that information. Uh, about the funds, the collections are able online. All inventories and catalogs are available on tilda.ws, uh, not only from Ukrainian, because also Belarusian or Lithuanian uh, archives we can find there. So check this out. For example, all information uh, about the collections in the Ukrainian archives we can find on the websites. And if, of course, for example, uh, there's a time we're talking about the metrical books. So, for example, metrical books from the area of Zaporozhye, we have only to put this Skachet catalog button. So, search the catalog and the PDF file will open us uh, everything uh, what, for example, is located in the local uh, historical uh, archive. So this is exactly, of course, written only in Ukrainian. So uh, we need to translate this. They don't have English translation about this information. But we, if we know a little this language, it's easy to find, for example, a proper information about the metrical books um, uh, we are looking for. All the information are, is in the catalog. 
long research, but everything, of course, is possible. So um, uh, the archival inventories. But just let me close the previous screen. Mm. Mm -hmm. I just I have a small problems with my computer for a moment. Okay, I think I can open it again. So, Rafa, whilst you're looking, we've got about four minutes left. Um, Mm -hmm. And um, we did see quite a few questions um, uh, in the chat. Uh, and one of the questions was, where, where do you find records um, mm -hmm. of things like naturalization? So I might take that one. Um, mm -hmm. And somebody's already mentioned Ellis Island. So it is one of the avenues mm -hmm. uh, or pathways for people. Th um, that's a, this is some, mm -hmm. yes, if we're talking about naturalization, others, uh, I was thinking to, uh, Put this on our next webinar because mm -hmm. also I'm planning to explain about the historical records from United States, Canada, Brazil, and other countries, also from the Western Europe. Okay, today I'm yep. just on focus on the Eastern border. That's right. But if people want to yes. find out, uh, or you know, a good starting point is Ellis Island because yes. as people were mm -hmm. entering, um, the officials were noting down. Um, you know, the language people spoke, uh, places of origins, a lot of the time um, um, there's a lot of spelling mistakes um, as well. So you have to be a little bit creative about um, understanding um, what people are trying to say. Uh, but if you don't know, and the only thing you know that somebody's from Poland, that would be a good um, uh, starting point. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and the other question was from somebody about naturalization. Um, and uh, let me just see what that says. <coughs> um, uh, yeah, there, there are questions about citizenship, which I'll take later, but I think, mm -hmm. um, Rafa, if you could check us through, um, so let, let's imagine that somebody just doesn't know where people are mm -hmm. from. They know that they are Polish and potentially came from former um, Polish territories. What would mm -hmm. be a good um, starting point for someone like that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, first collect all, uh, all possible information we have, including also we can get an access like the family search or ancestry.com as they have or Ellie Island, so Ellie Island database. Ellie sure. Island is really good to start, um, uh, but we have to understand that uh, it doesn't mean that all the passengers lists we can find there. Some of them were destroyed and uh, especially for uh, not from ever, uh, esp uh, especially the most, the well preserved uh, the uh, one of the best preserved uh, uh, records are from the hamburg um, uh, harbor to new york as almost they've been preserved uh, in 100% complete from mm -hmm. the other not exactly um, uh, of course um, um, national archives in united states uh, scanned thousands of records and they publish them also online most of them they are on uh, available on ancestry.com so we can use them ancestry.com is very important source but uh, sometimes uh, i'm warning people who are uh, using this to maybe to make their own connection by using ancestry because sometimes uh, some of the connections in ancestry may be wrong so uh, which yeah that's some, right. some so of the connection of the people let's say dombrovsky okay we yeah. got some that someone was a uh, had a dombrovsky ancestors um uh, who migrated to united states uh, in the middle of 19th century and said ancestry connected this family line with one of the greatest polish general jan henrik dombrovsky uh, a leader of the polish legion in italy yeah. under the 
and Napoleon on command. So, um, uh, and it was ridiculous, okay? But that connection was available on ancestor.com, but uh, 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 absolutely was wrong. But it doesn't mean that uh, old connections wrong, just I only mentioned that sometimes uh, uh, don't um, uh, take it for granted. That's exactly the same family line, okay? This okay. Is, and it requires uh, a very um, serious research, uh, including also the Polish arcade, to be sure exactly we are talking about the same um, uh, people. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Ellis Island is a good starting point. You just have to be uh, a little bit careful about spelling and records and how they're connected. Uh, we do have another question for you, Rafael, and it, it is this mm -hmm. for someone who already knows a specific village location. How would mm -hmm. we go about finding where to look for records for that village? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so, uh, so we know, we have some information about the village. First, of course, is uh, uh, this is exactly the problem you met Eva a lot of time. What exactly, uh, especially a very popular um, uh, name of the village, okay, as the, it could be located in a various region, not only in Ukraine, but also in Poland, in Lithuania or Belarus. And very often we are uh, trying to figure out that we exactly are talking about the same village which was mentioned on the archival source, and we should start looking in this area. But let's say that the, um, uh, we found exactly the uh, that village, okay? And let's say it was in Ukraine. So we have to find next uh, a proper parish affiliation. The, what uh, what was the exactly to which parish that village belonged and which parish could create it a proper um, uh, water, a metrical record uh, for the uh, for these people. Um, but we have a source to this one. So starting from the 19th century dictionaries through the 20th century publications, uh, all of them, they're also available online. Um, I'm thinking to make one of uh, another webinar to show um, uh, all the hopes we have to start this research. Maybe that will be an uh, interesting mm -hmm. subject. If we, if we learn about the parish affiliation, administrative affiliation, because we're trying also not only locate the metrical records, but also non-metrical um, uh, archival sources, okay, depending, of course, on the region and the state of the preservation of and the, the records. Date, yeah. Yes, but so we, if when, after, we have all general information, we know the people, we know the date, we mm -hmm. know the of the village town, we know the administrative affiliation or parish affiliation. Then the last part is to find a proper archive, or of course, if able, uh, a website where we can find, for example, scans online. And that's it. And the last, of course, um, the last step is starting this research to be sure we are right or uh, or no. And also, it will be very help. And I I trying to also to maybe exactly to show you uh, on the next screens, because we have also, now maybe I won't be uh, opening uh, the links, okay, but just only to um, to inform you. On the Google Drive, we have also thousands of the scanned records we can try to download. They have uh, they were divided in special folders, okay? So, for example, I found uh, many of records from the Dites of the Woods or Zitamir, or many of the archival fonts from the Ukrainian archives who have been recently published online. It's very interesting to explore some of the Facebook's um, um, accounts. Uh, one of the best, if we're talking about the research in the um, Eastern Borderland, is the website uh, called Genealogia Napolu i Kyiv uh, And uh, what I can suggest to you, okay, for everybody, you can all, uh, you can write them, you can, ask them about anything you think is important and almost uh, um, uh, every time you can expect an answer and anyone, uh, even someone could help you, you know, not only telling you about the information you requested, but also they could even try to help you to find some of the records, okay? So you don't hesitate to write, to use the Facebook mm -hmm. account can also um, be in touch with these people. A lot of people are really helpful, really. Yeah, okay. th th thank you. So um, in answer to, we've only got a few more minutes, so, so in answer to um, someone's question, yes, we will send you the presentation and all the links. And uh, if you have any specific questions about 
your particular family, we're happy to help um, as well and uh, tap into uh, Rafael's amazing knowledge. Now, I do have a few questions about citizenship. So I'm going to take that, those ones on just very quickly. Okay. Uh, one of them is about um, somebody's grandmother who left Poland in 1924 with a Polish passport, but then became um, Italian citizenship through marriage in 1935. So um, what, what happened um, in many countries um, is that um, if you married, um, being a woman, uh, you may automatically acquire citizenship um, of your husband. And that would disqualify you if there is a provision in the Italian or um, UK or US law um, that makes your grandmother Italian or a British or um, American citizen by virtue of marriage, if that makes sense. So, for example, in America, that was the case until 1922. I don't know what was the case in, uh, in Italy, but I can certainly check for you. Um, because in many countries, you know, um, the government realised that these laws were discriminatory towards women and they were um, scrapped. In the UK, it was 1948, US, as I said, 1922, in Australia, 1947, I think. Um, so I'll, I'll have to look into it. But if, if the country where, um, whose, has, whose citizenship their husband holds uh, enabled um, citizenship through marriage, then yes, you're, you cannot pursue it through uh, descent. Um, the other question is, my wife's father was born in Western Ukraine in 1925. Would this event be recorded in Ukrainian registers only or in the public registry office of the city of Warsaw or both? So that question would be uh, for you, uh, Rafael. So uh, Western Ukraine 1925, where would that birth city be? 1925, it should mm -hmm. be still the e uh, that could be only to say, or in the uh, Warsaw Ukraine. public office. Oh, in Warsaw. But, yes, but in Warsaw, but it doesn't mean that Ukrainian has uh, transferred all the records. Some of them could be also in Ukrainian public registry offices. So just uh, if you have an access, we have that links, you can find exactly if there's ex exactly the same mm -hmm. place your uh, answers were, were born. So this is the catalog of the records preserved in the public register office in Warsaw. Mm -hmm. and so you can write them and they have uh, 30 days to answer you if you send an official request to um, uh, Warsaw BC. But if they don't have it, that probably is a chance to find also the same record in Ukrainian public register office. Okay, so it's, it's potentially both. Um, another question about citizenship from Jessica Sue. My great grandmother and great grandfather came over before 1920, early 1900s. Could I still apply for Polish citizenship? I think they naturalized in 1915. So look, if um, it's it's worth checking because sometimes people applied uh, to be naturalized, but the actual naturalization process um, took some years. Um, so the qualification criteria is that we would have to find their records um, in Poland as residents, um, and then they would need to have naturalized after 1920. Um, and these cases are um, quite complicated. So uh, Jessica, so if you wanted to reach out to me, uh, I'll, I'll be able to help you with a bit more information. Uh, next question from Michael. For example, I know my ancestors came from the village of Novosholki between Lviv and Przemysz, now it's Velki, Novosielski, Ukraine. Uh, there is only one relevant church there. Where could I find records from there, uh, Rafael? There's a question to you. Mm -hmm. Just uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, I'll be very happy to help you with this quest after getting um, uh, um, uh, this information to start this research, okay? If that was between Przemysz and Lviv, I'm not exactly sure where it now is in Ukraine yeah. or Poland is in Poland, of course. That probably should be the best to start. Oh, one one more important thing. Also, confession of these people were they uh, Roman Catholics or Greek Catholics? Their religion, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, or Jewish, this is, this yeah. the, or or the Jewish, because because also this is a real difference. Okay, a yeah. lot of didn't get, for example, get that information. So at the start, we've been looking for Roman Catholics, okay? Instead of them, voila, there we are talking about the uh, yep. Greek 
orthodox okay or the russian orthodox so this it could be different place of the pres yeah. Uh, yeah. preservation because relating exp uh, exactly to the church affiliation we're talking now only on the metrical books okay because yeah. we're talking the administrative records it's a little easier because if yeah. now this is in ukraine or in belarus then we are looking in their archives if administrative affiliation was in Poland, then the records probably will be in Poland as well. Of course, yeah. in before a war, if we're talking about the eastern borderlands, once in Poland, okay, now the records are in the Ukraine, but thanks to the cooperation between the head of the um, Polish National Archives with the Ukrainian side or the Belarusian side, and uh, in the last years, we received a lot of information. And if you, one of you will try, for example, visit Przemysl archive, this archive- You might be uh, lucky, yeah. Mm -hmm. who started the cooperation yeah. with the Ukrainian archives, and they also have, they can, uh, they have scans from the Ukrainian archives, but they are not published them online. Instead of them, they can only show you on their lecture room. So oh, there's only one archive in Poland. Archive yeah, in yeah, yeah. You can okay. visit this archive, you can go to the lecture room okay. and make this research. So as I said, yeah. it's it depending, of course, on the church or the administrative affiliation. Yeah, we're out of time, but I just we wanted to reply to Jeremy just very quickly. Um, um, and this question comes up all the time. Um, given the invasion of Russia, what's happening with the archives? Well, surprisingly, we find, and this does depend on the region, of course, that is that they're very responsive um, and we haven't had any major delays at all. Um, so if you want to contact the archives directly or through us, they, they, they're working um, as, you know, um, as much as they can. Um, so we haven't noticed any, any delays. And um, I will post my email, Jessica, so, um, in a moment in the chat, chat box. Um, and look, if you have any other specific questions about citizenship or research, feel free to reach out. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that the slides will be sent to you. Uh, and we'll be exploring these themes, um, you know, as we go along. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Rafael, for presenting, as always, um, lots you, of Rafa. information. And thanks, Angela, for facilitating. And um, Jessica, I'll just send you uh, my email address so that we have it.